the principles of building unbreakable production grade data pipelines that no one has ever made a video about. In fact, very few people even talk about them. Yeah, why is that? I don't know, but let's call them my five secrets of building EGL pipelines. Hi there, are you a data engineer who knows how to build EGL jobs, but is experiencing frequent failures? Do you find yourself spending more time fixing broken jobs instead of building new pipelines and EGL frameworks? Your stakeholders are probably not pleased by that either. You want to focus on strategy and figure out the long-term vision for your data engineering team and tech stack. However, you're currently stuck in dealing with the day-to-day -day tactical and operational aspects of data engineering, which requires a frequent manual interventions. Well, if that sounds like your life as a data engineer, then you should keep watching this video all the way to the end because by the end of this video, I would have hopefully forever changed the way you think about building and maintaining data pipelines. Because in this video, we will learn the fundamental principles of building robust and production grade data pipelines that no one talks about. Yeah, it really surprises me when I think about it. It's so fundamental and core to data engineering, yet no one on YouTube has ever made a video on it. And here's an incredible fact about them. They are timeless, meaning these principles were not only relevant in the 2010s, but they are equally relevant in the 2020s and they are going to continue to be relevant in the future as well in the coming decades of 2030s and beyond or until ChatGPT replaces all of us. Another amazing aspect of them is that they are toolless or tool independent. This means it doesn't matter what ETL tool you use, it doesn't matter what tech stack you run, it doesn't matter what job orchestration tool you use or what cloud platform you use. These five principles are still going to be very, very applicable, fitting and relevant. All right, enough said, let's get to work. Hi there, everybody. My name is Saurabh and I make videos on data engineering. And in this video, we are going to talk about five timeless and toolless principles of building robust data pipelines. Let's begin with the very first principle. Number one, set up failure alerts. You know what's one thing that all EGL pipelines have in common? No? Let me tell you. It's that at some point they will fail. Don't believe me? You could hire the best data engineer in the world and ask them to build the most optimal data pipeline possible. However, given a long enough time frame, even their job will eventually fail. The key point here is that job failures are inevitable and cannot be avoided. There is no shame in acknowledging this fact. In fact, it is actually wiser to humbly accept as a part of a data engineer's role. To err is human and to job failure is data engineer. You know what's worse than a job failure? You not knowing about the job failure. Or even worse, your stakeholder telling you that a job has failed before you can discover it yourself. And it's not like setting up failure alerts is hard. It's actually pretty simple. Most ETL pipelines and frameworks have failure alerting built in. So just use them and get notified about failures through email, Slack, Teams, or whatever the heck you prefer. Number two, add logs and exception handling. Now imagine a scenario where a data engineer not only sets up a pipeline and learning from the first principle, they also set up failure alerting for it. And boom, out of nowhere, the job fails. Now while that's no good, but that's not too bad either because we will know right away that the job has failed. But it's only half the job done. Our logical next step should be to find the root cause of the failure. And how do you do that? Well, you just go read the logs. This means that you want to configure the logs in such a way that identifies the specific step of the pipeline where the failure occurred, as well as the reason for the failure. Now, good logs can help you quickly determine whether a failure occurred due to a bad data at the source, a server issue, a problem with the tooling, or infrastructure. Now let's understand with the help of an example. Let's say we have a data pipeline that loads data from a MySQL server database to Snowflake. And the data pipeline does it in three steps. Number one, run a select query against the MySQL DB. Number two, store the query output to a JSON file. 
in AWS S3. And finally, load the S3 file to Snowflake using Snowflake's copy into command. Now, what I would do is after each step, I would explicitly log the status of that step. Like after step one, I would add a log, an info log saying connected and ran the select state. Similarly, after step two, I would info log uploaded file to S3 and so on. Not only that, I would add exception handling to my code as well. What is exception handling? Well, as the name suggests, it's a piece of code that executes during exceptional scenarios or super rare occasions or edge case scenarios. It's a set of instructions that run in these specific situations. Now, different scenarios need to be dealt in different ways. Now, let's say someone drops the MySQL database table that our pipeline was reading data from. And as a result, when the pipeline runs, the select clause would fail and a table not found exception would be thrown. Now, in this case, I would handle the exception in a separate accept block and include appropriate logging within that code block. Similarly, let's consider another pipeline that sources data from an API server. Now, in some cases, the API server may be down or return 404 errors in the response when the pipeline runs. Now, in such situations, I would handle the exception in the pipeline code by using the back of decorator when sending the request to the server. So all I'm saying is that adding logs and exception handling is valuable for the following reasons. Number one, logs help identify where the pipeline breaks. Number two, exception messages explain why the pipeline breaks and allowing for graceful failure. This leads to faster repair times by providing more information about job failures. Now, do you see how small code improvements such as logging and exception handling can greatly enhance your pipeline's robustness and reliability? Number three, set up alerts on data and observability metrics. Let's start by discussing what observability is. In simple terms, observability is the functionality that allows us to gather metrics about our tools and artifacts. These artifacts can include code or data related to our business. Now, what is data observability? Data observability refers to the ability to gather metrics about our data. It is the capability to collect information or data about our data itself. Collect data about data? Let me explain with an example. So assume you have a data pipeline that loads data to a warehouse table once every day. Now, here are some good metrics you could collect about this table when the job runs. Number one, the row count of the table. Number two, rows absurded to the table. Now you might say, why are these metrics valuable? Let's build up on the same MySQL to Snowflake example. Now imagine a scenario where this job fails one day. This would result in the value of the rows absurded metric being zero. Now let's imagine that for some reason, not only does the job fail, but our failure alerting system also doesn't work. This means both the job and the job failure alerting mechanism are failing. Now, this would be a problematic scenario, isn't it? Now, to prevent such scenario, it is important to set up alerting for the rows absurded metric. Now, does that make sense? The key point here is to establish data observability metric alerts. And by doing so, you can ensure that we still receive notifications about failures from the data observability alerting mechanism, even when the failure alerting mechanism itself fails. Now moving on to infra observability metrics, which are metrics about the infra itself, infra meaning infrastructure, which is the hardware that is actually executing the instructions in your code that runs the data pipeline. Now most corporations, as you may know, don't manage this hardware. Yes, it's all on cloud. Now good examples of those kinds of metrics are CPU, the CPU usage of a database consistently exceeds 95% for a few hours. It is important to be notified about it. Therefore, we configure an alert for this scenario. Now, same goes for memory or RAM and job execution time. Now, if a given job has been running for hours instead of the typical three minutes, we would want to know about it. And so we set up alerts on it. Now, setting observability metric alerts are pretty simple if you're on cloud. Example, let's say all your infrastructure is on AWS, 
then you could leverage AWS services such as CloudWatch to monitor and alert on metrics. Or you could use a third-party tool. Datadog is a popular one nowadays. Woo -woo. <laughs> Number four, follow industry standards and best practices. Industry standards, as the name suggests, are industry standards. Example, if you're a data engineer who is a Python developer, which most of us are, of course, then we would follow the PEP8 style guide. It's definitely an industry standard. Another substantive thing to do would be to follow the industry best practices for any tools we use. Yes, every data engineering tool or software tool in general has its own set of best practices. Example, let's say we use Airflow for orchestrating our pipelines. A common mistake an engineer could make is import packages at the top level Python code. And this will significantly reduce the DAC parsing time and subsequently the performance. A best practice in that case is to keep those imports inside Python callables. That's just one best practice. Ideally, you'd want to make sure you follow most of the best practices as listed here in Airflow's official docs. So what's the point of following industry standards and best practices? The point is to learn from the mistakes that others have made in the past so that we do not make the same mistakes again. The point is to use the experiences and efforts put by other members of the community of the tool that we're working with as leverage. All right, moving on to the last principle, which is also my favorite principle, the KISS principle. Now, I follow KISS principle all the time, even in my personal life. KISS is short for keep it simple, silly. Example, let's say your stakeholder wants the data to be delivered to them every 20 minutes. Do you still, do you really need a streaming pipeline architecture for that pipeline? No, you don't. You definitely don't. When writing code, do you really need to auto-generate the SQL code from your Python code just so that you can brag about code automation? No, you don't at least not in most cases. The point is, be it your code, architecture, or your processes, stay away from over-engineering stuff. Keep things as much clean and simple as possible. This will make it easier for everyone in your team to work with you and the tools that you build. All right, so in this video, we learned the five principles of building quality yield pipelines. And they are, number one, always set up failure alerts. Number two, add logs and exception handling. Number three, set up alerts on observability metrics. Number four, follow industry standards and best practices. And finally, number five, follow the KISS principle. If you'd like to, please do let me know your thoughts on these five principles. Which one of these was your favorite? Click here if you want to learn about the basics of an usual pipeline. Click here if you want to learn about Airflow the most popular open source ETL orchestration tool right now in three minutes. All right, that's all I got for you. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.